Lord, we have come to this place this morning, a junior high school out of Florida, and in only ways that you can do it becomes a sacred and holy place where we get to be touched and transformed by you, by your word, by your spirit. We thank you that you are here, and we pray that you would soften our hearts, open our hearts, that we would be responsive, that we would be open, that we would be willing to take a next step closer to you so that we might become the next step and make your dream for us to become. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen. Bring your hands up if you ever wanted to get in somebody's skin. Thank you. 
do this morning is we are uh, going to look at a passage in First Kings. The next four weeks we're going to be in First Kings 16 to 17. We're looking at two chapters. And maybe I can just say uh, at the outset of the series too. How many of you love the pressure to give them a vision? You know, I'm when you're doing the pastor or the fundraiser or whatever pressures you. How many of you are like, oh, that motivates me and I love it now? How about you? How many of you are going, would you guilt me this morning? Would you please make me feel so guilty? How many of you have ever felt guilt oh, around this place, right? Guilt to two feet around. How long did that last, right? It doesn't work. So, how many of you have felt manipulated around money, around giving of your money? I have found, and I've been a pastor in the past, and I can just share with some friends that uh, I was ordained 30 years ago this month. So, I've been in, in full time ministry actually for about 32 years. I have never in my life ever felt good when I have felt guilted, manipulated, coerced, controlled, pressured, forced to give. Changed my life, it's not changed through my life. But when I opened my heart to becoming the, the, the person, the leader, the man that God wants me to become, and I was actually open that if, 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 if God, you want to talk to me about my life, I'm willing to listen. If you want to talk to me about finances, I'm willing to listen. If you want to speak into my life about sacrifice, I'm willing to listen. I have found that when I posture and position myself with an open spirit, that God has grown me. He's matured me. He has led me into a great adventure. Anybody that says the Christian life is boring, but it's just as so boring to be a Christian, you're not following the Lord. And what I love to tell Christians is say, you know, I'm just stagnant spiritually. You know, I tell them, give more. What? What are you talking about? Give more. The adventure of giving. If you're feeling flat, stagnant, they are not being fed, whatever it is in your life, you're bumping around from church to church looking for the thing. You start giving more, and you'll start growing more. I found that true in my own life. Because that's where faith hits your feet. You start, you start making movement. It's not just fear. Pray I believe in God. It's, it's when I start giving to the cause of Christ, to ministries that I trust, that God not only uses me, but He grows me. So let's look at this interesting story. You might, after I read this, go, wow, what does this have to do with giving? But we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, I think you have it in your rest. I don't know if you have it on the screen. Uh, just to give you some background, uh, the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of Israel was divided. There was a northern and a southern kingdom. We're in the northern kingdom as we're reading this. And all the kings, in the northern kingdom, they were, they were evil. The people of God, they start out right, they're fully devoted, they're all in, and then they slowly drift away. The leader, the king of the people, ends up leading the people of God away from God, rebelling against him, willfully turning their backs on him, worshiping false gods, pagan gods, the gods of Baal. And so as we pick this up, we are encountering um, King Ahab. He is the king of Israel at this time. Listen to what uh, this says right before chapter 17. It says that uh, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. So he's, he's um, in an overt way out there publicly worshiping false gods, defying uh, God's heart, the living God. And it says, he did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. He's a bad dude. He's an evil dude. He's got a wicked heart. And uh, so now we pick it up in uh, chapter 17. And this is not in your list, but I want to read the first seven verses. And now Elijah, he's a prophet of God, called by God. He was trying to twist me. In Gilead, and he told King Ahab, he goes to the king of the land. And he says, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Now, let me just stop there. He 
season where you were following God, doing what He told you to do. You were the good boy, the good girl. You know, you were wondering if you were winning that. Things have to get together and I'm actually getting worse. Is that possible? I was told if I became a Christian, my life would get better. How do things get worse? Well, let's keep reading the story. I don't know about you, but it's me before I just jump into this next section. But when I get to I find myself in a brook that's dried up. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe, maybe you're over. Maybe you are. Maybe you're sitting in a terrible brook this morning going, I'm facing a famine in my life. A famine of revenue. My stream of revenue is dried up. Maybe it's, maybe it's love revenue. Maybe, maybe you know your family and it's dried up. I don't know what it is, but maybe you're here this morning going, it's great. I haven't been the person God wants me to be. The question is, what is your next play? What's your next step? What's your choice that you're going to make at this point in your life? Are you going to run from God? No. God didn't work for me. I tried it. I tried him. It didn't work. I've heard that. People say that. And that's one of the temptations. That's one of the choices that you have to make when you get to that Kareth brook that's dried up in your life. Others decide, I'm going to run ahead of God. I don't, I'm not going to run away from him, but God needs my help. And so I'm going to do it for him because God's not behaving. God's not acting. God's not doing what I want him to do. So I'll be the rainmaker. I'll make it happen because I have what it takes. What does Elijah do? It says that he waited. He trusted God to direct him, to speak to him. And so if you look at verse 8, it says the Lord did speak to him. And what did he say? The Lord told Elijah, go, go to Napa Valley and a wealthy winemaker will take care of all of your needs. <laughs> Not quite. Go to and live in Zarephath near Sidon or Sidon, however that's pronounced, and a widow will feed you. Wait a minute. What do we know about Zarephath near Sidon? What do we know about widows? So, let's look at it. The Sidonians are the bad guys in the Old Testament. They're the evil ones, the hated ones. Sidon is the center of Baal worship. It's where the false gods, it's where Jezebel is from. And it's where Ahab, the king, is now promoting these false gods in Israel. This is where it comes from. And God sends Elijah there. This is where I'm sending you. And you know what? A widow will take care of you. What do we know about widows in that culture? Widows were outsiders. Listen to what one scholar writes. This woman was an outsider in every possible way. She's a Gentile which makes her a racial outsider. She's a pagan, so she's a religious outsider. She's a woman, so there's a gender outsider. And a widow, which makes her an economic outsider. But as you know and I know, God is the God of the outsider. God is for the outsider. God loves the outsider. God sees and cares about people that feel like they're on the outside. I wonder if maybe that's somebody here this morning. Maybe most of your life. Maybe in the last week. Maybe around family, friends, work. You're like, I'm on the outside. Church. You can't. I, I, I'm an out. God sees where you are. God knows where you are. And God cares where you are. Verse 10. You know, it's not always easy to go where God wants you to go or do what God wants you to do, but Elijah goes anyway. Verse 10 says, so he went to Zarephath. He trusted God again. And he said, yes. And what does he dis discover? Abundance? Hardly. This widow has just a few scraps. So, so just stop there. Tell me, tell me that you're getting this. Things are getting worse as Elijah is faithful and follows God, not better. Are you catching this? Are you making sense of this story? Have you lived this story? And how does it play out in your life? Do you settle in? Do you stay committed? Or do you begin to drift and turn your back and look for other 
people in other places to worship, other gods to worship, other things to meet your deepest needs. I love this about this story. Even though things are not getting better, but they're getting worse, Elijah discovers that God is a God who can be trusted. He's the God of surprise. God provides for his needs through a raven and now through a widow. First a raven and now a widow. Elijah is learning to trust God. He's learning that God can be trusted. He's learning that God will provide for his needs. He's learning that when he says yes, God will give him not everything he wants, but he will provide for his needs. Does that make sense? God provides through the most unexpected places. I wonder if you could acknowledge that this morning. I talked to somebody this week who was struggling, going, man, I need a family vacation. My wife and I haven't been away, and our family says, and wouldn't you know it, I had a friend who said, I want you to use our cabin. We have a family cabin. We want you to use it for free. He was like, what? Now he could go, well, man, that's because I'm such a good friend of that guy. It's all about me. But he said, God, God provided. He filtered it that way. He saw God's providing for me and my family. How do you filter? What's your perspective on all the blessing in your life? Is it you? I'm the man. Were you able to acknowledge, boy, everything I have comes from God. Every good and perfect comes from God. He's given me the personality. He's given me the network. He's given me the friendships, the contacts, the work ethic. He's developed that by his grace in my life, or is it all about you? That's a spiritual question and a spiritual issue for all of us. So now let's turn our attention to the widow. Elijah comes to the widow, and <laughs> you're not going to believe what he says. He says, don't be afraid. Make something for me first. <laughs> and use what's left to make a meal for you and your son. Now, she just told him, I don't have anything. I mean, I just got a little oil here, a little flour. My son and I, this is going to be our last meal, and then we we're going to die. That's what she said to Elijah. And he goes, make a meal for me first. <laughs> yeah, that should strike us as funny. It's like, wow, really? Why is, what's going on in this story? What's the lesson God wants us to learn in this story? Elijah says, don't be afraid. This is what the Lord says. There will always be food in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain again. And so this widow has a decision to make. She's going to put God's prophet, God's man, God's leader, God's ministry first. And then she takes the leftovers, or is she going to provide for her and her son first and give God the leftovers? That's really the decision for her and for you and for me. And I think it speaks to this issue of priority giving. Priority giving. It's a spiritual issue. You go back to Genesis chapter 4, the Cain an able story. Cain brought some of the fruits. Abel brought the fat portions, the firstborn of his flock. There's a little difference there. Cain brought the leftovers. Abel brought the first fruits, the fat portions. Are you with me? Abel made giving to God priority one in his life. And what's interesting, if you follow the story, the Lord looked with favor, favor on Abel because of this biblical principle. It's not a law. We're not talking about the law here. We're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're not talking about tithing. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a, a biblical principle that's way before the law is ever put into place. It's about priority giving. And this principle is we give to God first. We give to God our best, not what is left over. It's interesting if you read that text in Genesis 4, it says that Cain was angry and downcast because Abel's 
gift was favored by God and his wasn't. I was thinking about that. Isn't it true that that's usually the, usually the way that uh, that people get when they're stingy and grumpy? They get downcast. They get angry when we're stingy. That's how I get. When I'm a stingy person, I get grumpy. I don't know why that is, but my spirit, when I'm living this way rather than this way, I find myself... I, I find myself more easily irritated. I find myself looking and comparing more and judging more rather than being freed up more. And so here's how the story ends. Verse 15 and 16, she did. Well, you know, what's she going to do? She did as Elijah said. And here's what the text says. This is what the Bible says. They all continued to eat for many days. There was always enough. There was always enough in the containers, just as the Lord had promised. There was always enough in the containers, just as the Lord had promised. There was always enough. There was always enough. Four words. Say them with me right now. There was always enough. Do you believe that? If you give, there will always be enough. That's a spiritual question that I have to ask and you have to ask because fear is what prevents so many of us from giving to God. Can God be trusted? Is God trustworthy? When he tells you to do something, can you count on him? And maybe the bigger question for us this morning is, can I be trusted when it comes to the resources God has put in my care? Can I be trusted? Can you be trusted to steward, to direct, to give the resources of God to the places he wants you to give them? So let me say this again. Giving out of guilt, obligation, pressure, manipulation, it's unwise, so don't do it, and it's unhealthy. It develops a critical spirit, a resentful spirit. That's how I get when I feel pressure. So don't do that. But, so what, what's the healthy way to give? It's giving out of a heart that trusts God, that loves God that is thankful to God for what he's done, for how he's providing for you. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, follow your treasure, follow your visa bill, follow your checkbook, and that's going to help you discover where your heart is, what's important to you. That's all you got to do. Go through your checkbook, get online, look where you spend your money. And you'll be able to tell whether God and his purposes and his ministries have your heart or not. I'm going to close with this story. Friday, I had a chance to go swimming with a couple guys in our church, Jeff Rohde, Jamie Chilton, some of you know them. And uh, we went to Los Banos Pool. And many of you know the story that uh, it's like three or four years ago, four years ago now. Jamie Chilton helped me to swim in such a way that I could do the Alcatraz swim up in San Francisco. And I, it's not that I didn't know how to swim, but I, was, I had fear around the water and I, I couldn't swim long distances. So he started me out at Los Banos Pool in the slow lane. And he took one of those floaty devices that you put between your legs here because they, they, they keep you up. And I was like, I'm not doing that. And he goes, yes, yes, you are. That's going to help you. And so I did. And I, I went from the slow lane. And then over the course of a year, I actually graduated. I went to the medium, medium lane. And I have been in the medium lane for the last four years. It's awesome. I, I go to Los Banos Pool. I jump in the medium lane. And I swim my mile. And then I get out and I go. And I'm like, yeah, all right. Well, on Friday... The medium lane had like six swimmers in it already. And so there's slow. Yeah, there we go. See, there, there it is. Slow, and then there's medium, and then there's fast, and then there's very fast. Well, there was one swimmer in the very fast lane. And Jamie said, let's jump in the very fast lane. And I'm like, <laughs> I wouldn't even get near the very fast lane. I mean, it's intimidating. It's like, I'm unqualified. There's no way. That's going to be embarrassing. I want to save face. Let's go to the slow lane. 
So he jumps in the very fast lane. And I jump in with him. And I'm like, I gotta swim fast. So I just like <laughs> I mean, I'm just swimming as fast as I can because I'm, you know, like I gotta show that I, I belong here, right? Well, I, I swim a few laps and I'm kind of tired, but a few more very fast swimmers get in the lane. And for those of you that swim, you know, I'm swimming, all of a sudden I feel a hand on the back of my foot. <laughs> It's like, it's like driving in the fast lane and someone's blinking their lights on you, right? I got the message. It's like, hey, get out of this lane. You're not fast enough. So I went, okay. Swallowed my pride. Went to the fast lane. Jeff Rohde was in the fast lane, blasting out of us. I'm like, man, he's a good swimmer. I don't know. I'm going to try and keep up with Jeff. And uh, I started swimming in the fast lane. And I was able to... Keep pace. I was shocked. I've never been in the fast lane. Never been the very fast. Never been, I was in medium or slow, but I went into the fast lane, and I was able to maintain my pace for a mile. And guess what? I didn't drown. <laughs> I, I actually lived to tell this story. I'm okay. I survived. I even thrived. Now let's apply that to giving. What lane are you in? Actually, what lane you're in doesn't even matter. Some of you aren't even in the pool yet. Some of you don't give. You're on the side of the pool. And you watch everybody else give. And you say, well, I give my time. You know, I, I haven't found anywhere in the Bible that says we're not called to give money. I, I just can't find it. It's a spiritual issue for me. And it's a spiritual issue for you. And my question is, what's holding you back from stretching yourself right now? Maybe you're in the slow lane. You go, you know what? It's time for me to move over to the medium lane. I'm going to do that. Between now and the end of the series, it's just 21 days. Month of June. What if for the month of June, now it's already June 4th, so you are already got four days of grace. What if, for the month of June, you said, I'm going to change lanes in my giving. I'm going to spiritually stretch myself. I'm going to give financially. And I say this often here. You don't, if, 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 if we don't have your heart here at Ocean Hills, if you're going, actually, I'm, I'm more committed to Navigators or Young Life or whatever it is, Inner Varsity, great. Then give to them. But what if over the next 21 days you said, I, I, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to be that widow in this story. And I'm going to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give more than I've ever given before. It's going to make me uncomfortable. I'm going to be stretched. I don't even know if I can keep pace. Well, guess what? Guess what happens at the end of June? You can go from the very fast lane back to the fast lane. You can even go to the slow lane if you want. But when was the last time you stretched yourself? You said, God, money's a spiritual issue, and I'm going to trust you right now. I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to do it. Because I'm kind of bored spiritually. I'm kind of going through the motions. I'm kind of I read my Bible. I check the box. I show up to church. I check the box. This is an opportunity for all of us to trust God. And it might, might be for you giving five bucks more. A month. Might be 50 bucks more. Might be 5,000. I don't know what it is for you. I, we're not, it's not about legalism. You have to decide that between you and God. But what if... For the next 21 days, you said, I'm switching lanes. And I wonder if you won't discover God's blessing. And you won't discover that actually you can keep pace at the next lane out. You can make a difference. And it's sustainable for you. That God won't resupply, because that's what he did for the widow. He resupplied. She gave and she, and, and, and God resupplied her needs because she trusted him. So let me, let me close. Why don't you bow your heads? For some of you, you're going preach it. For others of you, you're going ooh, 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 ooh. So for those of you that are going ooh, let me press in on you. Just look. What's the ooh for you? Is it a control issue? Is it a fear issue? Is it a Guilt, or you feel... What is the issue? Don't give. If you don't want to give, don't give. 
This is just between you and the Lord, you and God. What, what's holding me back? What's holding you back from saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in a different lane this next month of my life. And I'm going to give more than I've given before. And I'm going to see if God does resupply. And God does provide for, not my, my wants, but my needs. And so, Lord, I just, I want to say yes for all of us. I want to say yes for, for Natalie and myself. That this would be an exercise of faith for us. It's, it's kind of scary. Why not? Lord, where you provide, help us to be a conduit that we would become faithful givers, not fearful givers, but faithful and fruitful and front runners. Let us be the pace setters because we know that our faith inspires faithfulness in others. And so I pray that we would live by faith. We thank you that you did not hold back, that you did not withhold your love, but you gave everything on the cross. And we look to the cross as our example, that you gave it all for us so that we might know you and that we might live with purpose in this world. And so now as we come to this table this morning, I pray, that as we break off the bread and, and, and drink of the cup and we proclaim your death and your resurrection and your love and your mercy and your grace, Lord, I pray that you'd meet us in Jesus' name. Amen. You're invited to come to this table not because you must, but because you may. It's not an obligation. It's an opportunity for you to connect deeply with God. There's a devotion that we read, many of us on staff, many of you in the church read this, this great book by Paul David Tripp, New Morning Mercies. Let me read these words to set us up for what we're about to do here. Individualism is not freedom. It's bondage. Living for yourself is not liberty. It's a self-imposed prison. Doing what you want to do when you want to do it and how you want to do it has never been the good life. It never leads to anything good. Making up your own rules, following your own paths, leads to disaster. God calls you to himself and commands you to follow him so that by grace he may free you from you. Because of sin in us, we think bad things, we desire bad things, we're attracted to bad things, we choose bad things, we are blind to much of this going on inside of ourselves. So not only do we need God's presence and wisdom to guide us and protect us, but we need his grace to rescue us. And so we come to this table in need of grace because we're selfish, we're hoarders, we're greedy, we're stingy. <laughs> And we can give more to people in need, to people that are hurting and that are suffering, so that more and more people will, will find and follow Jesus. And if that's your heart, then you're invited to come to this table and receive forgiveness and grace. If you're open, maybe today's your first time going, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't know it all. You don't have to know it all. Is your heart open to God's love for you and his plan for your life? Then you're invited to come. And you can kneel. Both sides of the table are open, and uh, and maybe today, how about if we do this? I'll just maybe your way of commitment. If you're saying, I'm, I'm going to do the 21 day challenge. That, I know God just was tugging on my heart. And I need to do that. Maybe when you come to the table, would you kneel? That's your that's your way of saying, God, I'm in. I'm, I'm next 21 days. I'm I'm I want you to know I'm committing myself to to change lanes in my giving. And trust you in a way I haven't before. And whatever that means for you, you just come around the table and kneel and as a way of committing yourself to God for the next month. Okay, is that, is that cool? We good? Okay, when you're ready, come. We're going to sing. Nico's going to introduce this song to us.